because this particular interview, I get to interview the person that I live with, finally. So what on earth made you want to learn all 32 Beethoven sonatas in a very short time? Uh, well, I'm not usually into birthdays and special numbers or anything like that, but I did know that Beethoven's birthday was coming up, uh, Beethoven's 250th birthday. And starting actually around late 2018, I thought, wouldn't it be nice to actually learn all the Beethoven sonatas? And I, I've been... Uh, uh, since I was little, I used to sight read a lot when I was little, and I, I played through the Beethoven sonatas so many times, probably hundreds of times when I was little, and so I kind of got to know them, not to play them well, but just to, to know them all. Uh, and so they and Beethoven's always been one of my favorite composers. Uh, so, and it's such a, such a varied group of pieces, 32 piano sonatas, all different from the very beginning of his life to the very end. Um, and so it was an ex seemed like an exciting project, and I, I thought I, I wasn't every time I started going at it, then something would come up. Our festival got busy, or I got had too many other concerts, and I couldn't do very much of it until this year when the uh, pandemic started. Then I didn't have any concerts anymore, and I had I uh, didn't couldn't go out and do things, and so I thought, well, maybe I really do have time to actually learn all of them. Uh, so it was not till this year that I really started seriously trying to uh, get at learning them all. Yeah. And knowing you for as long as I have, I know you like to do really extreme things, like bike 100 miles in one day. And I would think like learning this amount of music in such a short time would be kind of comparable to doing some sort of like amazing athletic feat or some kind of endurance test. Yeah, it's a, it's a longer term endurance than my usual bike ride. It's just like one day, 14 hours of riding or something like that, and just all over. But this is, this is a... Uh, requires a little bit more pacing than my usual kind of endurance feats on the bike. Um, and uh, yeah, playing, uh, learning all these sonatas because actually I thought about it and I've only probably really worked on eight of them of the 32 before now or before at least late 2018 when I kind of a little bit got my feet wet. Um, and so, but uh, just very calmly and systematically kind of going through all the sonatas and uh, learning them in a different way. Uh, I go through it in different ways. First, I start by figuring out what my fingers are going to do. Which fingers am I going to use? Um, and I always revisit the decisions later as I learn it better, but just to, to know the basic idea. And then second time through, I try to figure out, well, what do I really want to say What is what, with this piece, or what is Beethoven trying to say that I can show? Um, and so the second time, I, I don't care if it's perfect or anything. It doesn't have to sound really good, but I'm starting to figure out where, what are the gestures? What, how does the piece, uh, what's important about the piece? And then the third time through, uh, I try to really almost learn it. And so we're going to be streaming these sonatas once a week um, from mid-June all the way through to the end of the year. And so in a way, um, you can pace yourself around that timing as well, I think. So That's right. I don't have to be ready with all 32 sonatas. Uh, I think, tomorrow. you know, yeah, I think maybe in, you know, in f five years, I could be ready to play them all in a few days or something like that. But I don't have to do that this year. The advantage of learning them all at once is it does, uh, unlike somebody who, say, kind of had played them all before and then was just coming back to them to, to do the cycle, I'm kind of learning a lot of them, and the advantage of that is I'm kind of learning it all as one thing, like Beethoven's sonatas, and learning what he was like and how he changed over time, but also how he was the same, and uh, just experiencing that in a way that uh, I don't think this, I think this uh, unfortunate series of events that are happening in the world has made it possible for me to do that in a way that it wouldn't be ever been possible for me or for other people to do in this way in other circumstances. Um, and so do you feel like you're getting to know him as a person better just by spending this much time with him? I mean, I'm actually getting to know him better just by listening to you practice, um, that there's so many different sides to him. I mean, there's... Yeah, well, I feel like I'm getting to know his musical personality. I'm sort of probably glad from what I've heard that I don't have to really get to know him as a human being, because I think he was a little difficult in some ways, and, and he didn't show his full beautiful side that he showed in his music in in uh, in life all the time but getting to know his musical personality is really really amazing because uh, yeah even in his musical personality there's there's certainly a, a, a very blustery kind of angry side but that's kind of overemphasized sometimes I think that comes up sometimes but uh, a lot of times it's just so gentle and beautiful and then sometimes it's just so playful like the early sonatas it just feels like uh, Playing the playing the pian uh, writing piano music for him that was he was a pianist so he was probably really just totally comfortable with that instrument when he was young and um, and at that point he could hear everything still um, and uh, I think he just 
felt like it was this one gigantic playground where he could just do all these really amazing, fun things. And playing it on this instrument here um, is just uh, really helpful for that too, because it's such a playful instrument. It's not uh, kind of uh, it's not kind of awkward like the modern piano. It's just it just really shines forth that that playful aspect of his personality. But the later sonatas, I don't even think that he was really he had retreated into his internal world. I don't think he was listening to much of anybody else's music. So it was almost like he was just developing out of himself, where who had originally developed from these these other influences. And so we're so lucky to have all these instruments in our house and to be sheltered in place, not only with each other but also with these three incredible keyboard instruments. So is there an example of something that um, we could hear that you really show the difference between, say, playing something on this um, copy of, what is it, 17? 1795. 1795 piano compared to playing it on the modern piano that people could hear? I mean, one of the amazing uh, pieces to is the Waldstein Sonata, which was maybe written a tiny bit later than this piano was made, but very close. Um, and uh, and it's an amazing piece, of course. And the last movement uh, is written in this very special way with special pedal marks. And, and Beethoven, if you look at his pedal markings, they don't really totally make sense when you're looking at them for the modern piano. He'll put the pedal down for a long period of time, and then it seems like he doesn't want you to use much pedal the rest of the time. And, uh, and that doesn't really often work on the, on the modern piano. But on, the, on this piano, which has got knee pedals, so you can't really see them, but um, but you operate them with the knee instead of the foot, um, and uh, and this piano it really works because each um, the instrument doesn't have as long a resonance, so uh, you can hear the clarity of each individual note at the same time that the that the pedal allows the very low notes to ring, and so you get a whole kind of or almost um, beautiful small orchestral sound. Um, and uh, and I think that uh, people will often say, oh, Beethoven sound you know sounds better in the modern piano. Beethoven would have Beethoven was always frustrated with his pianos, which is true. He was always, he always wanted them to get better and louder, and uh, and so um, so why not play them on the modern piano? And um, sh sure, the Beethoven probably would have loved the modern piano, but his, he would have written something very different for it. The thing is, he wrote with this instrument in mind. Um, he that's that's what he orchestrated for. So he wrote certain kinds of octaves and certain kinds of pedal markings and certain kinds of figurations that really worked on the instrument that he knew. He didn't know this piano, or he would have written the music quite quite differently. Mm -hmm. And so that's really why why it why it works. And you can hear on the opening of that Falstein Sonata last movement, uh, you can hear that it's so so clear and yet so resonant at the at the same time. And then uh, then when he gets to kind of more normal stormy thing. Um, at the end of like the first page, uh, then you can hear how everything is very, very clear and dramatic sounding in the storminess and, and not as not so wooden like it is in the modern piano. <laughs> I think it's really exciting for me. Getting to know the Waldstein Sonata on this piano has been one of the most exciting things I've done mm -hmm. done recently. Yeah. And then the other piano um, that we have, uh, can you tell us a little bit about that one? Yeah, that one's uh, a Rausch from uh, 1841. It still has no metal frame, just like this piano, but it's you can see it's bigger. Uh, it it was made about what's a fi almost 15 years after Beethoven died, uh, but uh, you can't have everything, so we don't have all all the pianos. I I would love to have a piano from the 1820s that was perfectly in shape, but uh, but it's very close, um, and uh, so that's what I use. Uh, basically, I've just used the cutoff of when did when there there not enough keys on this piano. So the Waldstein just fits on this piano, and so it works very nicely. And then the Passionata, which is just a couple years later, 
Uh, for whatever reason, he just explored the upper registers of the latest pianos, which really don't fit on this anymore. So I just transferred to this. But but also the pianos at the time of, in the 18 teens and 1820s were getting uh, getting more towards this piano. Um, and still has the same kind of characteristics of clarity and same things that you can kind of do with the with the pedal. It has its own both of them. Uh, maybe even more this one, but bo both of these pianos kind of have more their own beautiful sound resonance. You sort of think of a cello or uh, having a sound, and I feel like these pianos more have a sound. The modern piano, you more create a sound by what you do with playing lots of notes at once. But uh, it's like a sustaining sound. Yeah, it, almost by itself. So sometimes you don't need. So that's why he'll write vast stretches, and yeah, sometimes he wants you to probably use a little pedal even when he doesn't mark it, but not as much as you might. And because, um, and so I find in like in this in the recap of the Appassionata Sonata of the first movement, uh, there's a passage where it just gets, uh, it's a very strange recap because instead of Beethoven's usual thing where he just pounds the, uh, pounds on the piano for the recap and announces it, the very beginning of it is a little bit more like what Brahms would typically do where it kind of sneaks in and underneath there's this uh, undertone of repeated note that's kind of the wrong note in the bass uh, and then you hear quietly the, uh, the tune come back and uh, very, uh, it's originally already a mysterious tune in, in the right hand in octaves. Um, and it's actually possible to play that, uh, I've just been working on that passage, and it's actually possible to play it on my Rausch um, uh, without almost any pedal, just little touches here and there, and so and it resonates so well that you can hear the sustaining of the melody, and at the same time you can hear this undertone of bop, 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 in, the, in the left hand. <laughs> And then I, just to see, I, I wandered over to the modern piano to see what it would sound like, and I... Just, uh, it just can't, doesn't quite work. It can't work quite this. I mean, everybody tries to do it, and it feels like it either needs more pedal for the right hand, and then the left hand gets too heavy, and the whole thing just seems too loud, or else if you tried to play it without pedal, it wouldn't resonate well. So it just works, seems to work so much better. Yeah. And then there's one other example on that instrument that we compared with a modern piano. That's right. That, that was the Opus 109, and... Mm -hmm. uh, and there it's more a matter just, again, I guess of the resonance, just the pure resonance of the instruments. Very simple. This is a, such a simple, beautiful opening to the, to the uh, sonata. And it really sounds beautiful on both instruments. Uh, but there's something about the pure resonance of the, of the uh, 1841 instrument uh, that just makes it sound uh, like just warmer and just more natural somehow. <laughs> The sound just sort of comes out of the piano and practicing it, it feels like, again, there's certain kinds of things that you just don't have to practice in the same way on these instruments because the instrument just does it. And then there's a million other things that you believe you have to practice a lot. But, but, um, but it feels like it, sometimes it plays the music itself because, yeah, that's what it, the kind of more the kind of instrument that the music was written for. some of the cello sonatas um, in between the piano sonatas and certainly as a cellist playing with these original instruments suddenly 
I don't have to force the sound forward at all. Like the piece just falls into place the way that it's written. And that's never true with the modern piano. It can sound fantastic. But as a cellist, for instance, you have to play extra loud to fit with what's happening and all the resonance that's going on in the modern piano. So not to mention that the pianist, you have to really control it and try to play with a great deal of energy, but softer than it feels natural, which you don't usually have to do in these instruments. You just play and you can feel good about what you're doing. You can just let go. Yeah, and so I think like even for the solo sonatas, like voicing would just feel completely different. Like certain lines might just kind of pop out in a more natural way without as much extra kind of... Right, and again, work. Beethoven voiced chords in a certain way. Uh, uh, he would often voice chords, lots of notes in the left hand, uh, all close together. When you play him on modern piano, you think he didn't know what he was doing because it just sounds uh, it just sounds dull, kind of like uh, like that or something. <laughs> um, but um, but um, but on the on the old instruments, it sounds perfect because those notes resonate so well. The bass notes are just amazing on these old forte pianos, and it just resonates so well that you can hear more of a cluster of notes. Well, so so it's heroic, and <laughs> it's a heroic amount of practicing, and it's a heroic undertaking. And not only that, um, you're tuning like all the time that you're not practicing. So this is a huge um, thing. And it's amazing that we can just do this in this house right here. And because normally when we do the festival, we would have to move the pianos, these historic pianos up to Sonoma. We'd have the piano tuner there. But basically now right. we've just got this in-house festival going on. Luckily, I can even replace strings now because this <laughs> piano here just breaks strings now and then. I just I finally learned how to change my own strings so that we don't need to have people coming into the house. Um, and uh, But really, it's been, uh, it's really made me, uh, it's been what's kept me sane and happy during this crisis because uh, I just, I feel like I am with somebody. So I've I've I'm, I've been at times I've written some music too. I've been a composer, and I, one of the hardest things about that is you're really alone with yourself, and you sometimes very exciting, but you always feel quite alone. But uh, when you're playing someone else's music, learning Beethoven's music, I always feel like I'm with somebody. I'm with his musical personality, and it just feels uh, like having uh, company. Like I have you, and then mm -hmm. I have Beethoven in the house too, and it and it feels it feels really nice. And we can't wait to share all of this music with you starting in the middle of June, going all the way to the end of the year. And then we'll have also special concerts during July that we're looking forward to sharing, too. Yeah, we get to play with other people, too. Yeah, we'll <laughs> see a couple other people. It'll be so exciting. Okay, well, you better start practicing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs>